Thanks for the introduction. I'm Jing Xiong. Since I'm seeing a lot of old friends here, so I'm going to take a step back to talk about my childhood dream. When I was a child, I'm living in a big city, just like anyone in a big city. Sometimes I feel very lonely. So my dream is to have a, some kind of robot as a friend or a companion. Of course, if the robot eventually can evolve like this one in the Battle Star Galactica, that would be really wonderful. <laughs> but even if it doesn't, it would still be pretty cool if, like, to be a nice companion and give me a hug when my nips, when my nips paper get rejected. However, today, this gene still remains to be a gene. One of the biggest problems of a robot is that the robots today are mostly blind. They can see nothing. And my research in computer vision is to fix this problem to let a computer to see. As we know, deep learning has enabled a lot of breakthroughs in computer vision. Like, for example, deep learning enabled this continuity on 2D object classification on ImageNet. And those big companies like Baidu, Yahoo, uh, Microsoft, Google, still making more progress, and basically, we're about to solve these problems. Just to give you some idea about the task of 2D object classification, here is a photo. Putting it into a deep learning, deep convolutional neural network, after a lot of GPU cycles, eventually, you will get one word out, chair. This is pretty good, right, because it's crap, but it's kind of boring, right? This is such an interesting photo. Uh, it's a nice shadow, nice texture. You can guess the season. You can guess the location. A picture is worth a thousand words, not just a single word. And computer vision is not just to guess that single label. There's something very wrong with this 2D object classification. And today, I'm going to talk about deep learning, deep visual learning beyond 2D object classification. By that, I literally mean beyond that. So I'm going, my talk is going to have three parts. How we move from 2D to 3D, how we move from object to scene, and how do we move from classification to action. Okay, let's start with 3D. If I show you this photo, everyone can basically know what's going on, right? You can see the, the, that this boy has a girlfriend and see the back side of his girlfriend and hallucinate the other side. Because in your mind, you have some kind of 3D shade representation. But if I show you the other side of the picture, this is what's going on. <laughs> You know, life is just really just a matter of perspective. <laughs> but this demo so that you actually have a very, very strong 3D shape prior in your mind. And people play with this on the internet, like right? they sell some crazy marks, that like you can buy a mark like this. See from the side view, it looks perfect, but see from the top view, it looks like this. And here is another one. See from top view, it looks perfect, but see from the side view, it looks like this. <laughs> and our people in computer vision, Pioneers already know that this is a very important queue. The 3D shape queue is such an important queue. And they invent a lot of theory. However, if you look at all the cell of the R algorithm, either by power by deep learning or non-deep learning, none of them use any 3D information for visual recognition. The only place I can ever imagine that we actually this information is useful, the 3D information is useful, is uh, for place recognition and so on, that doing instance level matching. So here is what we're looking for is a 3D uh, deep learning representation, a 3D good, uh, good 3D representation that can represent 3D shapes. Here is where the deep learning can come to rescue. Ideally, we want to have a representation that can automatically learn from big 3D data, not manually hand defined, and be able to generalize, not just to memorize it. And it should be compositional, like it should be start from object parts and then combine, combine together to bigger object parts, and eventually to have a bigger object. And it should be beyond the recognition. It's not just doing predicting a label. You can do other tasks like straight completion. So we propose a, a deep learning network called 3D shape net, a 3D deep learning network. What we use is a convolutional deep learning network that can learn the joint probability distribution between a 3D voxel and the object label. And here is some visualization of our network. This is the first few, the first layer. You can see that you learn some surface. A higher layer, you learn the whole object. And in between, you learn object part, for example. To change this network, what we need to do is we feed the network a lot of computer graphic 3D models. Like right here, we voxelize it, represent by a 2D voxel. Uh, we build a big, very big data set called Princeton Model Net data set, download from the internet, crawling many websites for different shapes. And we feed all this network, uh, all this data into our network to change the 3D shape representation using deep learning. And here is some object category. And here is some overview of the, those chairs we have in our database. And after we change this network, now we can do something very interesting. Right? The network knows a 3D shape. Now you can ask the network, like, for example, you can ask, 
your smartwatch, hey Siri, generate some toy discs for me, and it will generate some toy discs for you. I'm not sure why it's useful, but still it's fun. Okay, but you can also use this as a 3D feature extractor. Like in computer graphics, people study this problem. They handcraft engineer, hand engineer a lot of 3D features. Uh, um, by doing deep learning, we can beat the state of the art computer graphics straight features easily without any problems. So you can see the significant uh, improvement. And here is you can do straight retrieval. If you're building a 3D straight, uh, search engine, you will do retrieval. You can see that our deep learning feature again. Uh, can significantly outperform all those handcraft carefully engineered features. What's more is we can use this model to do 2D object detection as well. Like for example, these days everyone knows that we have depth map, we have kinet. Like basically you have a shape, you can take a picture, you can get a depth map of the picture, and then even what we do is we can represent this depth map in the 3D box hole representation. Uh, if you cut one slice on from the depth map, basically corresponding to this slice, you can actually use our network to hallucinate what's missing there. So eventually, you will be able to use the 3D shape representation to get a label. Like you can get this as a chair. You can also hallucinate what's the missing part as well. So you can use this to do, like for example, Microsoft KingNet object recognition uh, for both straight completion and predicting the label. So here is some result. If you input the depth map here, um, we can hallucinate the shape, the missing part, because the depth map, you only basically seeing a 2.5D representation. You actually don't see the other side of the object. But by using our network, you can hallucinate what's behind. And we can also use this for doing serious object recognition tasks. Here we compare the state of the, one of the state of the art by Richard Socher and Andrew Ng, that, they, that paper in 2012. We can see that by doing this deep learning in 3D, we can get a much better performance over what they're doing is deep learning on 2.5D. Okay, we can do it even push further, use this idea to other tasks, for example, like, like deep build planning. Like, for example, if you imagine a robotics scenario, you see a picture, see an object from one picture, and you cannot recognize the object. Like, for example, here is a, a depth map you can see from the back of a sofa. You can use our model to predict whether this is a sofa or a dresser or a bus truck. You hallucinate the, the other part. But you're still not very sure, right? Because it's very ambiguous. So what you can do is, now you can ask the robot to move a little bit, see from a different viewpoint. But which viewpoint to choose? Then that's the, the so-called view planning problem. The, the, we want to choose the next best view so that you can see the object in a position to reduce the uncertainty as much as possible. So we can basically use the same 3D shape model because you know what's a shape. You can hallucinate a shape. You can use this to do joint inference to choose the next best view and to, to, to predict it, and then you can figure out jointly from many different views. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, moving from object to things. Uh, as we all know, that object without things is some kind of just like a toilet without bathroom. It's really, really not very good. Um, as always, in the morning, I have given an introduction that scene classification, the simplest way to formulate is to give an image, you want to predict this is a part and so on. Um, many years ago, before deep learning, we built one of the state-of-the-art systems for scene classification. By combining a lot of careful hand engineer features, we can get 38% accuracy. At that time, we used the standard database that we built uh, called Sun Database. But as I already mentioned, that this database is too small so that we cannot do deep learning on top of it. And together with a lot of colleagues in MIT, we built this place data set that you already see in the morning, so I will skip it a little bit. But the point is, by doing deep learning, we can get a significant performance improvement. And after that, we can see that with more and more data and deeper and deeper network, you basically can attain much, much better performance. So naturally, our next step is to build a bigger data set and have a chain of even deeper network, right? So that's what we do. We build a large-scale scene understanding database, which is several order, two, one to two order, a magnitude bigger than the uh, places database, to train a different network. But building those, those, that many uh, images, you require a lot of label. And we're actually running out of label on my counter. So what we do is we do deep learning with human in the loop to gather the label. OK, with this bigger database, we can basically train a better model. Uh, you can get significant performance improvement. And currently, uh, in two weeks, we are organizing a workshop in CVPR to encourage people to try many different algorithms on this model as well. 
Okay, in my last part, I'm going to talk about how do we move from classification to action really quickly. So the idea is we want to do autonomous driving. We don't just want the machine to pick the label. We want the machine to do, make some decision to take actions. So I'm going to jump a little bit because we're running out of time. Uh, so what we do is we propose a new paradigm. Like for example, given an image, the traditional uh, the autonomous driving system like from Google and from Mobi, they're doing mediatic perception to predict the bounding box of the object, and then you do driving. Uh, the other approach is just take the image, and for example, you change the deep learning network to map it from the image to the um, autonomous driving actions. But what we're trying to do is we're going to predict the affordance of the driving. Like given an image, we want to predict the distance from the car, the distance from the landmark, because that's what we really care about, right? We don't really care about the bounding box of the object. We just care about the, how far that car is from me. By doing this, we can drive much better. So here, I skip a lot of slides. But basically, here is the driving in action. We do this task in the video game. That we, we hook our game, our deep learning engine in real time with the video game so that you can play autonomous driving in the video game. Because we're not a big company, we don't have the resource to build a real car. <laughs> okay, um, but we do test on a real environment, right? For example, here is what we test. Here is after you do the computer, use the computer graphic game to change the deep learning model to drive, and now you can drive in real world scene as well. It's not perfect, but it's pretty cool as well. But here is actually a human driving, but we're doing prediction here. We manually check whether it's correct or not because we don't want to put the life of the grad student in danger. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me, where is my mouse? Okay, of course, we do a lot of careful evaluation, and we compare a lot of state-of-the-art systems, like the deep learning system that NVIDIA just announced in their GTC conference, that they're doing this kind of style system. And we demonstrated that our system is actually much more robust than they are. Of course, again, we are playing in the video game only. Okay. Uh, okay, just to quickly summarize up. Uh, in this talk, I talk about how we move the video learning beyond 2D object classification by talking about how we do 3D deep learning, how we build a very, very gigantic data set with uh, 3 million photos just for one category, and to change a better scene classifier, and how do we use deep learning to drive autonomous driving cars. Um, uh, all the data and source code are actually available online, so you can check our website. And um, finally, I want to acknowledge all our funding agencies to make this happen. And um, of course, a lot of grad students and collaborators that actually do a lot of work behind the scenes. Okay, thank you much. <laughs>